This is a soft lecture in a series of lectures that I'm recording for you. You need to study this on your own. This presentation is what you can call things that they did not teach in PT school. Nothing in this presentation will come in your exams, but until and unless you have your concept of what is acute care clear in your mind, you will have difficulties in traversing the intricacies of practice in this area. When you're done with this presentation, you will be able to conceptualize the outline of realities versus fantasy of acute care physical therapy. Acute care is a niche practice area. It is niche because it is unique in a way that no other area of physical therapy practice comes even close to not just complexity, but also the volume of knowledge needed to safely maneuver through this setting. In this section, I will try to cover the unique aspects of acute care physical therapy. Uh, and uh, so, welcome to a whole new world and let's get started. Let's begin with the very initial basics. Acute care is strictly a non-linear practice. So what do I mean by non-linear? To understand this, uh, we would first want to understand what I mean by linear thinking or practice. So strictly speaking, a linear process is easy to conceptualize. Let's suppose in an outpatient setting, someone comes in with a back pain or maybe a shoulder pain. And your job would be to evaluate why it is hurting, what tissues are involved, and how you can treat it. If you know the pathology, uh, then you can treat that pathology. And that is a pretty straightforward issue. Another scenario I could paint for you is a nursing home patient who has almost always functionally deconditioned. So your job is to basically design and implement an exercise program based on the primary reason for deconditioning. It could be a stroke or old age or immobility for whatever reason and so on. The outcome of such physical therapy program is always measured in functional recovery. You can apply these concepts whether you are treating children or adults in any non-acute care setting. However, this is not the same in acute care. Acute care is complex. Acute care is multidimensional. You will have multiple sources of information to weigh, multiple sources of information to analyze, and your intervention may or may not be needed. Indeed, a lot of acute care is evaluation only and you provide your professional opinion for your referrers for the best care of the patient. What do you think is happening to the patient in terms of their ability to move or not be able to move? What do you think is the best rehabilitative approach for the given patient? Is rehabilitation even indicated? What information is a physician seeking from you must be at the core of your referral analysis that should happen even before you step into the patient's room. Let's take a few examples to illustrate this process. An elderly male who lives alone, for example, arrives to the hospital with a non-healing diabetic foot ulcer. Now the patient is old and can walk a little bit around at home with a walker, but family is reporting and the patient verifies that he or she has had a few falls. The patient lives alone. 
the podiatrist is consulted and the physical therapist is consulted. The podiatrist finds that there is osteomyelitis of the foot and recommends for amputation, but the patient refuses amputation. At this time, the physical therapist sees the patient. What should the physical therapist do? Is walking the best intervention for this patient whose foot was recommended for amputation? Is walking even needed? Or is it safe? The biggest goal is to understand why the physician referred the patient to you. Obviously, you cannot amputate the foot. And amputation is necessary for preserving the life of the patient. Now, decisions in this scenario automatically become extremely complex. If you show the physician that all you do is walking the patient, which means you either say, okay, we will walk the patient or we will not walk the patient, whatever be that, then that is what the physician comes to expect from you. The physician will think that if I need somebody walked, I'll call the physical therapist. And they will never consult you for anything deeper. How best to care for this patient? Is this patient safe to put pressure on their foot? They wouldn't be using your knowledge if you don't show it to them that you're capable of that. And yes, your license permits you to be able to make those recommendations. So, if you show them all the things that your license allows you to show them, then they will not only come to expect a new reality from physical therapy, but also come to be dependent on it, which raises your value to not only your referring physician and referring sources, but also to the system in which you work, the health system. If you say you need to evaluate a patient like the one that I just described, you, of course you need to evaluate. What all things do you think you're going to find? This is something that you actually should know before you even evaluate the patient. You should be able to predict it. I can tell you what you will find even without stepping into a patient's room. This is not what you have studied in other areas of physical therapy, where you are told to examine the patient first. Sure, there are certain things you will never be able to tell unless you see the patient. But again, in this scenario, you do have to examine the patient to be able to get to those particular uh, things that are not in uh, the chart and you cannot guess. For example, what's the range of motion of a shoulder or a knee of a patient? Well, I can tell you without even seeing the patient what the gross findings are going to be. And here's the kicker. I can tell you at least 80 to 100 percent of all the things that I will find and I will need to do and I will need to advise the patient even without seeing the patient. Patient, seeing the patient is an important component. It is a part of the professionalism and the patients need a reassurance. They need somebody calm and being able to advise them what next these patients are critically ill and some of them are more than others but they are ill and this is not just a shoulder pain or a back pain and they want a calm approach to tell them yes we are handling you we are dealing with your problems let us do the thinking for you what other questions can i answer for you these things are not in an instruction manual, but that is what the patient is expecting. If we just go in and tell them, oh, we are here to walk you, it probably is not the best approach. So the question is, how do I do that? How do I project what will the patient be like? What will they need? So at the core of every PT evaluation is to consider the presenting complaint and the historical data. 
unlike any other setting you have complete access to all this information in the patient chart you already know why they have come to the hospital what their underlying previous problems are what medications they are on and so on if you look at the social work notes you may also know in well in advance where they live and who they live with what kind of housing they have so what is the purpose of the extensive history taking in the hospital setting is there a purpose at all sure but how do you know what to look for is history responsible for the patient's symptoms or problems you have to consider all of this in deciding if there are things that can be fixed even without working on the patient quote unquote this is why acute care practice is non-linear you have multiple dimensions to consider in every decision making now if you do not consider all these multiple dimensions you'll find yourself in the realm of ho-hum average or even below average practice where therapists often just walk the patient and get their work done they come in at six seven eight o'clock in the morning and they are out by two three four five o'clock in the evening this kind of work and thinking process requires not very deep thinking but if you do how the uh, how the experts work in an acute care setting then you have to uh, respect the fact that the thinking processes require deep analysis and something like this is not automatically learned not easily it requires some excellent mentorship from clinical instructors and other um, other professionals around you anybody can be a mentor who knows more than you problem is if you're not well mentored you may still learn but it may take you years before you can really deliver the promise of physical therapy being practiced at the top of your license now the term acute care it is controversial why is it controversial so i'm going to try to explain it here does this terminology mean that it is hospital based practice perhaps but it does not include the approach to a patient who has a clinically acute presentation would that not also not be acute care let's suppose you see a patient or a person collapse in a shopping center parking lot what kind of care do you think would be given to this patient is that not also acute care in the parking lot of a walmart hence the original assumption of hospital-based practice is perhaps not accurate however there is a reasonable approach to the term acute care while it remains that any acute care that is given to the patient with an acute change in condition and can be called acute care, yet a pure hospital-based training is perhaps an important aspect um, of uh, learning about acute care uh, and is certainly a niche area that cannot be learned in any other acute setting. Therefore, acute care as a term means all of the above anybody who has an acute change in condition but must have a component of hospital-based training so what am i trying to tell you uh, here is that true acute care cannot be learned in a non-hospital setup yes we modify that in physical therapy practice because there are not very many centers where we can send students so we we modify this which is allowed by CAPTI to use places like sometimes subacute care or nursing home based rehabilitation and calling that acute care 
It truly is not. It must comprise of a hospital-based training. And that is why uh, there are these residencies that have come up where people can go in practice under mentorship in acute care. So this is an image of an intensive care unit. I want to raise this issue up now so that I can explain to you a little bit more about certain myths of acute care. Now obviously uh, intensive care units such as this will be in a hospital. No other setting will have it. On the right is a nursing station from where any professional including nurses can monitor a range of, uh, of uh, vital signs from a centralized location. And on the left is the picture of a baby on life support medications and of course other life support equipment. So many students at the beginning of their education in the area of acute care often think that acute care or even cardiopulmonary specialty means working in the ICU. And while that may have some basis, it is simply misleading. It's not untrue, it is misleading. Acute care admission and management is a vast subject and ICU is only a small component of that. So this brings us to the question of where are most of the patients in a hospital? So when as a student you first hear of acute care, you're jolted to think of a jarring scenario of where these patients could be in the ICU. But realistically, where do all the patients reside in a hospital on a given day? The answer to that is there are so many units in the hospital. Patients can be in the emergency department where they often arrive. Some patients, of course, can also be directly admitted from their doctor's offices into the wards, the nursing units. Okay, and these nursing units are usually separated by the most obvious specialty. So, for example, if it's a vascular service, then they can be admitted to a vascular unit. If it's a cardiac service, then a cardiac unit, and so on, cancers, and urology, and nephrology, and different units. It's just different floors or nursing wings of the hospital. Now, many times, patients arrive with no diagnosis, as we will discuss later on. So, uh, so, no one quite knows what's wrong with those patients and it happens a lot and the treatment is usually done by guessing um, the problem now um, while this guessing is playing out the patients are often put into observation units where they undergo a battery of tests and consultations and this is where many times physical therapists may be consulted Remember, these patients do not yet have a diagnosis since no one quite knows what's wrong with them. They just know the patient has symptoms. So what should PTs do in these circumstances is an interesting question. Should they treat the patient, quote unquote? So the critically sick, of course, the patients who arrive in the hospital with critical illness, they rapidly get moved to the ICUs. Sometimes a patient becomes more critical after they arrive to the hospital and they need to move to the, um, either need to go to surgery and then come to the ICU for observation or stabilization, or they can go straight to the ICU, okay? So for example, someone who might have sustained serious injuries or serious emergency condition, like serious injury from a motor vehicular accident or a explosion of some sort, or uh, medical and surgical emergencies such as acute abdomen or a heart attack, a cardiac event. The decision to move critically ill patients to the ICU is taken, but here is something very interesting that decision 
can often be arbitrary and dependent on the expertise and training of the attending physician. So who really knows who needs to go to the ICU is dependent on the physician to a lot of extent. If you look at literature in this area, you will find that there is no gold standard, okay, for ICU admission. So this leads to an interesting conundrum. Some patients in the ICU are really not that unstable and others, there would be many others who are quite sick and unstable. It really is a clinical situation where the PT may have to make an independent and astute decision to whether a patient is stable or even ready for physical therapy exam, even before deciding the course of treatment. Now, this leads to something I want to also expound on, and these are complex thoughts, so hopefully you will follow along with me. In many scenarios, these physical therapists have the tendency to ask somebody, and the most available person is a nurse, but the nurse does not necessarily know all the things that you need to make a decision for uh, an evaluation or an intervention. They don't necessarily know it. Now, this itself is a situation with a caveat. Hospital practice is the only place in all practice arenas of healthcare where you are specialties who can provide you with necessary guidance. But you have to be wise in asking the right person to guide you, and the nurse may not always be the right person. Okay, so um, when I say you need to independently make a decision on seeing the patient, you need to be able to get information from a number of sources and then decide yourself, not because somebody else told you. Now, the physical therapy consults can come from any of these many areas in the hospital okay so um, so what are these areas where you can get consults from you can definitely get it from the ICU but you can also get it from the emergency department the observation units where patients are waiting for a diagnosis or the nursing units where most of these patients usually are and therefore, you may see patients with a lot of different and competing signs and symptoms in the same patient, often because of multiple underlying disorders occurring together or occurring because one condition leads to another or because the treatment being done to one problem causes, the, causes another problem to come up. It really gets very complex and it is a dynamic occurrence so what that means is that it is happening constantly and continuously some of these changes in patients are predictable which requires knowledge and experience or they can be unpredictable so the question that of course up is um, if physical therapists should receive their uh, their consultations only from fully diagnosed patients and the answer is that um, you have to take it case by case basis uh, and uh, in a hospital practice it's almost never guaranteed okay it PT students often feel that patients present with a diagnosis, but they don't. When they come to the hospital and when a physical therapy consult is generated, sometimes there is no diagnosis. In fact, actually it's quite a bit. So something that is clearly indicative of a diagnosis is helpful, but let's clarify the assertion. First of all, what do we mean by patients presenting with? Patients can present that means come to the hospital, a clinic, or maybe a bed in a nursing home or a home uh, of the patient itself 
for the first time evaluation. At the time of the first interaction, it may be clear that their complaint has a diagnostic basis. For example, a shoulder pain may be indicative of a shoulder pathology. A trauma victim who is hurting or obviously injured, you will know that that is why they are hurting or injured uh, because they have an injury. A stroke victim may have telltale signs. And this is all very straightforward to deal with because we know what we can expect. This is how a lot of PT and indeed medical education is also tailored when we are going to teach you a medical condition and tell you what to expect in that medical condition. And of course, you can, uh, you will need to learn how to deal with each of these scenarios. However, what is important to understand is that in a hospital, most patients will present with what is called constitutional symptoms and signs. Now, very briefly, the constitutional symptoms and signs are indicative of underlying organic disease, which means there is an underlying disease in the organs and are nonspecific. To make the matter even more complex, there may be non-organic symptoms and signs as well. For example, people may have psychologic basis in certain symptoms and signs. So, in learning the various models of, uh, of uh, disease and disorder, um, you will realize that there is no clear indication sometimes of what system or disease diagnosis there is right away. This is not um, everyone for certain because you know there will be patients with confirmed diagnosis, but large number of patients won't. And before any conclusive treatment can be done, the cause of these symptoms and signs need to be diagnosed. So the takeaway is that the patients coming to the hospital are unique situations because they do not come with diagnosis, but rather the symptoms and signs. And because the current trend is to refer to a physical therapy uh, right away, we physical therapists end up being called into the game way early and it is getting earlier and earlier because it facilitates discharge. It is beyond the purview of this presentation to discuss constitutional symptoms and signs, but I encourage you now to review the link on this slide to get a better orientation of what it means you will need to be signed in to your Marshall account. This is simply a summary of a patient admitted to acute care with symptoms, symptom-driven admission, as I call it. You can see this is a 64-year-old female with past medical history of hypertension, gastric, gastric esophageal reflux disease, um, uh, and peptic ultra disease um, and a remote history of vaginal cancer successfully treated 21 years ago presented via the emergency department with a five-day complaint of intractable nausea and vomiting so guess what's brought the patient to the hospital nausea and vomiting okay the patient's chief complaint is uh, she cannot keep any food down and the doctor's decision is to admit the patient to oncology which is the cancer unit and will get gastroenterology uh, on board which means they are consulting gastroenterology and then they are consulting pt and ot what what do you think the physician uh, consulted us for in this patient could be anything and uh, really it is a bedside decision to figure out what that anything is okay so now here is a sampling of the type of referrals you can see in a hospital setting as a doctorally prepared profession we owe more to the system than just getting these patients up and walking them we need to offer to find out what is principally wrong with the patient uh, and when I use the word wrong, I mean to say, what is their underlying diagnosis? 
what diagnosis is preventing them from moving because that's what's relevant to us. So what is the differential diagnosis of that movement disorder? Not the differential diagnosis necessarily of the cancer or cancer-like symptoms or GI symptoms or headache. No. But why can the patient not move? So based on that, you can make the decision, will therapy help? Is there a problem with existing discharge plans, which means can this person return to where they came from? And so much more. And these are all needed to, uh, to make your decision and to advise the physician. Okay. So you have to remember that there is no guarantee of a diagnosis. Hence, the treating patient is not the objective. Rather, figuring out what the underlying diagnosis of a movement disorder is and thereby the decision of whether treatment by physical therapy will make the patient uh, better and is a bigger responsibility for us, for each clinician, based on their expertise standpoint. Therefore, at the outset in acute care setting, expect that a patient may present with many symptoms and signs, thus making these clinical syndromes instead of diagnosis. These may be related syndromes. For example, a dehydrated patient who's uh, who's presented with being confused. We call it altered mental status or AMS, which may also cause acute kidney injury because there is not enough water in the body. So there is not enough water to uh, allow the kidneys to do its job and ends up with a kidney injury. It also may be that the patient has acidosis, something you will learn in the cardiopulmonary course and a host of other problems all related to one another and yet each one can be a distinct diagnostic conundrum so you are not going to be treating the patient because of the dehydration or because of their kidney injury bigger question will be is their mobility system impaired if so why and will mobilization of this patient be required given the circumstances just for an example, the other day I was responding to a consult request on an elderly female patient who had multiple broken lumbar vertebrae. The neurosurgeon said that it was inoperable because of poor bone quality. And he also said that a brace would not be feasible because of some reason which is not important right now. Anyway, during my consultation, the bigger question for me was to decide whether I should move the patient, even for purpose of an initial exam. What would I recommend to the referring physician in such circumstances? Think about that for a moment. Here is an example of a series of separate diagnoses which are related. In this patient, there is an underlying osteoporosis, hence there are pathologic fractures developing in the spine. But then the patient fell and developed a fracture of the humerus, which is what brought the patient to the hospital at this time. The pathologic fractures of the, or compression fractures of the spine were an incidental finding the physical therapist has to consider the state of spinal stability due to the spinal fracture. Because remember, this consult comes to you even before maybe orthopedics has seen the patient. And also with the humeral fracture and decide whether the patient can be mobilized and when. Will it be safe to mobilize the patient? What prerequisites should be met? to mobilize this patient, if at all. We also have to think, what made the patient fall? Is the patient safe in their natural environment? Will it be safe to discharge the patient back to the home? All of this and more.
This is another example of a patient in an acute care hospital. Here the patient has multiple problems and multiple symptoms. And the signs and symptoms uh, are because of involvement of various uh, body systems. The first order of business is to prioritize which problem to manage first. Let's uh, uh, investigate a little further. The problem of breathing dif difficulty in this patient, what is causing it? Is it because of two different diagnostic pathologies, each of which has different management? Uh, based on the diagnosis, you know, you can see there is pneumonia as well as COPD exacerbation. The physical therapist can help in both the situations, but to different degrees. Question is to know in depth how PT can help in each condition and then you can decide to what degree you can manage it. I cannot just teach you how to manage one thing and, uh, and expect you to know the other thing. So each one of these have different management styles for physical therapy. Add to that the complexity that you can say we will teach the patient to do things that they are not able to follow up with because they are homeless. I did not slip it in to make this more complex. It is how it is in this particular patient. So some of the medical uh, treatments that can be given require an infrastructure. Okay, and this infrastructure, for example, a person who has respiratory embarrassment may need oxygen. That means they need a home where there is oxygen. But what if they are homeless? What if they have no insurance to go somewhere? You have to take that into account. Take the look at abdominal pain. Could be for any number of reasons. How does it impact your decision making? Increasing lower extremity edema is another problem. What is that from? Can physical therapy help? Where in the list of things do you address this feature? As you can see, these are disparate and diverse problems. What you can do for each one of them depends on the depth of your knowledge and using that, how to prioritize what problems to address first. If the physical therapist says that it is too complicated or too early for our role, then there should be a good reasoning applied. That is the role of the doctor of physical therapy. One important, perhaps very important thing to bring up at this point is that patients do not come to the hospital for physical therapy and cannot strictly stay in the hospital for uh, therapy. I see this trend of physical therapy students believing that the physical therapist can delay discharge just because patient needs more therapy. And I see that trend in uh, your plans of care and frequency of visits that you think you have available to you when you do your cases series. This is furthest from the truth. If a patient does need therapy in the hospital, it is mostly consultative and somewhat for progressing their function towards discharge. Discharge cannot be delayed for therapy just to make the patient optimally better. If a patient needs continued therapy, they can go to the next level of care such as an inpatient rehabilitation or a nursing home, provided they have insurance for it. They cannot be held in the hospital just because you want to do more therapy. So most of the time we do see patients for treatment beyond our initial consultation, but actually the PT role in a hospitalized patient is generally incidental to this is incidental to worsening of function because of underlying disease or many other many diseases together and the medical management of those diseases that lead to complications with mobility. This means that the patient requires therapy to at least achieve minimum competency for discharge. This can be uh, or there can be no admissions just for therapy alone. 
It bears stating this repeatedly. It is not guaranteed that a patient will need PT when they come into the hospital. The caveat is that in some cases, there is a reasonable guarantee that the patient will see a physical therapist at least once or twice built into a pathway progression when they are admitted. The best example of this is a patient who is admitted for, let's say, a joint replacement, typically an orthopedic procedure, which is planned, then physical therapy is going to see the patient. That is one of the few caveats. So it is also important to realize that because patients do not come to hospital for therapy, they do not always have a buy-in for need for therapy. Many times, patients are fighting for their lives or scared for uh, their health, and they are not able to fathom why a physical therapist is in their room to see them. They do not feel obligated to allow you to examine them, far less to treat them. This is so unlike, let's say, an outpatient clinic or a rehabilitation center or a nursing home where the patient already knows what the physical therapist does and why they need to see the physical therapist. In other words, in non-acute care settings, the patient already has a buy-in before they have entered the premises. That is not so in the hospital. Patient may have no idea that they would end up seeing a physical therapist. If you try to encourage them, uh, stating that you want to mobilize them, then many of them might refuse, stating they can already mobilize themselves or have someone else from their family to mobilize them. What happens in such circumstances? You cannot see the patient, and all the time you have spent reading the chart may be lost. Therefore, you cannot bill for that service either, and it affects your billable productive time. Hence, it is important for you to know what other services can you offer as a physical therapist unless you want to be refused. How do we get information on who to see in the hospital? In the older days, and even now, it is often the word order, and that was used to be the magic word to get a referral from a physician. With the growth of physical therapy profession in terms of education and its eventual master's and doctoral degrees, there was this overwhelming demand to move away from being ordered uh, culture. So where do we stand now, uh, given that we want to move away from being ordered? Nowadays, we see three new words or phrases that have been introduced into the lexicon, the vocabulary, in other words, to replace the order culture. The term evaluate and treat, referrals and consultations. Loosely speaking, these terms are used interchangeably by physical therapists. And yet, what do you think? Do all of these terms mean the same? Should you respond the same for each of these terms? That is the question. Let's evaluate them. Evaluate and treat in context of physical therapy is a legal term. It was initially coined as a language in that it would allow for treatments to begin and progress after the initial evaluation without having to seek prior separate physician authorization for treatments following the evaluation. In this case, a confirmed diagnosis was and is still provided by the physician. The physical therapist is not supposed to make a differential diagnosis and hence the physical therapy treatment would be fashioned based on whatever the physician medical diagnosis would be. Now, before you rise up in arms, um, 
this is not an absolute statement because physical therapists can make suggestions and perhaps uh, modify the diagnosis by speaking with the physician by going back and forth trying to explain why they feel the situation requires a secondary diagnosis but this is generally the fact and the above sentiment that I have just told you about the physician providing the diagnosis generally holds so referrals have strictly um, correct meaning provided you understand it referral means transfer of care from one physician to a second medical professional could be a physician or somebody else when the second professional is assuming or taking over the responsibility of treating um, a patient so one can think of this scenario when the first physician is a family practice uh, and is sending the patient with a new heart uh, problem to a cardiologist or a new uh, symptom set that looks like cancer to a cancer specialist and asking them to take over the entire care of the patient in some scenarios the primary physician may keep some bit of control but may not but they are essentially transferring the care to somebody else similarly in context of physical therapy a general practitioner may send a patient with an isolated back pain or shoulder pain to a physical therapist and ask them to assume the care of the patient that requires no further intervention from the primary physician that is the true meaning of the word referral obviously this does not happen regularly in the field of physical therapy but it does uh, from time to time will occur now let's evaluate the meaning of the word consultation and this is perhaps the most important for you to understand it's not just a fancy word to mean an evaluation let's begin by reading the exact definition provided by the centers for medicaid and uh, medicare and medicaid services take a moment pause this presentation and read it on the slide that I have provided you. Note how it says that one medical professional is asking another professional for advice, opinion, or recommendations, suggestions, directions, counsel, etc. in evaluating and or treating a patient because the second individual has an expertise or knowledge beyond the requesting professionals knowledge or skill it's a very important distinction therefore when we use the word consultation there are implications beyond that of simply evaluating the patient and treating them a consultation drives the need for advice to the primary the person who has referred the patient to you as well as to the patient an evaluation only helps the physical therapist make their own goal and outcomes determination for the patient but what are the comp components of advice that a consultation should generate towards the patient and what should be told back to the primary person who has sent the patient to you knowing that and acting on it is the true meaning of consultation so what are these components let's look at that if you look at the bible of medicine which is the harrison's principles of internal medicine there is a section in each organ system category that starts with quote unquote approach to the patient with symptoms of disease you will notice that all disorders present with certain typical symptoms and signs and the approach to that patient is to rationalize which mean understand 
analyze and understand the cause of the symptoms. Hence, consultations require a differential diagnosis to identify how to deal with the patient with the cluster of symptoms and signs. Not all consultations are for the purpose of treatment. Many times consults are just for the purpose of monitoring the progression of underlying disease. Examples of uh, such monitoring of progression include, for example, the placement of a baclofen pump in a patient with severe spasticity. When the spasticity is no longer manageable by oral drugs, they can choose to put an intrathecal baclofen pump. Baclofen is a drug that is used to reduce spasticity. And when it is delivered right into the intrathecal space of the spine, in that case, the patient may, patient's uh, spasticity may be reduced without having the additional side effects of oral drugs. Now, whether this baclofen pump will work or not is a big question. They can place it. And it is a lot of money to get a baclofen pump and place it. And if it is not going to provide results, it means that it is an indwelling device which can get infected, plus the fact that it will be thrown away if it is not used, if it doesn't help the patient. So in this case, the physician may do a pre-baclofen pump access into the intrathecal space by doing what we call a lumbar puncture and they might place the baclofen directly with a needle instead of a pump right into the intrathecal space. They would want the physical therapist to examine the patient before and after the baclofen is inputted within the intrathecal space to see if it makes a difference and if that difference is demonstrable and documented, then they will go ahead and place a real pump. Okay, this can happen in so many different scenarios. For example, another scenario is whether they should put a certain type of uh, heart valve within a patient. Will it improve their function? And to demonstrate that, they might actually ask a physical therapist to see before and after. So these are examples of some of the diagnostic elements of doing physical therapy consultation in an acute care does not happen in any other setting of the healthcare universe. So we were talking about what are the components of a consultation. Once a consultation is performed, there are three R's that need to be satisfied. These three R's are actually in true consultations as defined by Medicare. And all of these three need to be satisfied for the proper amount of reimbursement to be obtained. There is a separate uh, category of billing code for a consultation versus an evaluation even for physicians and for anybody else but primarily for physicians. A consultation is so much more. What are these three R's? So the three R's are shown to you on the screen. R1 is request from a physician or another appropriate service. So there must be a request for a consultation. A consultation cannot be simply provided unless there is a request from another provider. The second R is rendering the service. That is where you provide the evaluation and uh, advise the patient and things like that. But there is a R3. This R3 is reporting back to the primary person who sent the referral. In that, you have to include what is your opinion? What are the treatment recommendations that you have going forward from you the physical therapist standpoint and how will that help or not help in a scenario where you think the physical therapy intervention is not going to help you have to state that 
all of this should be included in a correspondence. So if you in the hospital setting do not have the ability to write a letter back to the physician, then your final part of your document in the assessment and plan, you need to state to your referring source your opinion and all the advice that you are going to tell them back. You can say that this is the treatment. Now, some small treatments can be delivered, but if you're contemplating major treatment, uh, and that really applies more to physicians than physical therapists, but if you're contemplating something novel, something different, you should check back with the physician and say, this is what I'm planning to do. Do you have this? These are my reasoning. Do you have any opinion on this? Okay, and so clarify that with the referring source. Now, we have long advocated for reaching where we have reached in the profession. We want to be consulted early. We want to be able to provide opinions. We want to pick up patients and reject them depending on whether therapy can help or not. All this is great powers to us, but you have to remember, with great powers come great responsibility. So when physical therapists, if even in today's environment, say that, oh, come on, this is not my job, this is the doctor's job, I just want to treat my patient. This is not a very doctoral uh, response. It cannot be sustained in the era of doctorally prepared profession. So if you are only planning to treat patients, it really falls in the realm of technician uh, grade work. Now you have to remember that technicians can be really stellar you can be very skilled at a job, but technicians are essentially people who do not analyze beyond a very narrow set of um, re requirements. And so this is not supported in today's top of the license practice. So how does a new PT or PT student pause for consultations, um, uh, you know, that has been requested of them. So what I have to suggest to you here is figure out what the physician wants, first of all. Oftentimes you'll realize that the physician has no idea what they want from the physical or the occupational therapist in acute care. They usually just um, write PTOT consult or consult PTOT. And this is especially true of new physicians and residents. Why do they do it? Because they have simply uh, written uh, because somebody asked them to write it. A nurse or a senior resident or a senior physician has asked them to. I give you three scenarios that you can commonly find in these situations. If the referral or the consultation request has a known diagnosis, then try to find out how does the diagnosis, current or previous, impair the physical mobility of the patient? Will that somehow limit discharge? Can they return to their previous place of living? What needs to be done to accelerate discharge? Because this is a very important role that we play in the hospital. How quickly can we get them home? Because you have to remember, in a hospital, patients um, are admitted, but the hospital doesn't make any money until they're discharged. So the quicker they're discharged, the more the cash flow. So speed of discharge is a very important consideration for every clinician providing care to a patient in a hospital setting. What if there is no diagnosis in a patient? In that case, you review the symptoms and compare with the signs during the exam and even before the exam from the chart, evaluate that, analyze it, 
and figure out or try to figure out does it have any reason to impair mobility now mobility will help with many different aspects but the primary goal remains discharge and remember when you set your plan of care to limit the number of days and visits based on the expected number of days or visits for the patient to be in the hospital because of their primary diagnosis. So for example, if your patient is expected to stay in the hospital for two days and you write a plan of care that is 14 days, two weeks, three times a day or twice a day, three times a week for two weeks, these are all really going to waste and shows that you have no idea, no appreciation for how the acute care environment functions. And I again draw your attention to that. Tailor the plan of care to the length of stay of the patient in the hospital and not the other way around. Because if you write a plan of care that extends to two weeks and you come back next day and the physician has looked at your note and said, oh, this person doesn't know anything, pa discharge the patient, go home. How do you feel? How would you feel? You think that the physician is not being respectful to you? But remember, the physician doesn't have a whole lot of role in today's healthcare environment in terms of discharge because it is pushed for by insurance. The insurance company might say that we don't care, you send this person back home in three days. Then that is what is going to happen. If something goes wrong, maybe another day can be added, but needs proper documentation to impress upon insurance why an additional day is needed. And then depending on who is requesting it, the physical therapist can of course do that. But then you have to justify why that needs to be in the hospital because the hospital is the most expensive place where the patient can receive care. So can if they need continued care, can they go outpatient? Can they go rehab? And these are the decisions you have to make. Now, if you cannot figure out or verify why the physician has consulted you, do not hesitate to call the physician. What do they want? Discuss with the clinical instructor if you don't understand it, but get that understanding before you progress too deep with your consultation and your plan of care. And then when you follow up with patients, you reinforce your plan of care with the ultimate goal always remaining, remaining a speedy discharge. Now, some cases may require a post-medical uh, procedure uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you do an evaluation and then the physician does a procedure and then you may need to do another evaluation. That's another reality of acute care. Okay, I hope I have given you a fair amount of uh, orientation to what are the myths and fallacies associated with new physical therapy students coming into acute care. Now this is a very 30,000 foot overview of everything that I would like to tell you. And you see how I cannot really talk to you about everything that I've spoken here in the classroom in a very formatted uh, topic. So if I'm teaching pathophysiology of a disease or dis disorder, I wouldn't have the ability to talk about all of these things without going off on a tangent. That was the purpose of this presentation. I hope it has given you things to think about. I encourage at this point questions and uh, feel free to contact me over Microsoft Teams. Please put a question in the question in the chat area and uh, tag me and I will respond at the speediest ability that I have. Having said that, thank you 
and see you in class soon. Bye now.